News Tavern has been declared open. Marco Longhi, the Conservative Member of Parliament for Dudley North, joins me. Welcome to the programme. Very, very good to see you. A 29 intake and somebody who'd done a lot of things before, you know, getting into politics. You've done a lot of local politics, though, hadn't you? I mean, you're a black country man. Yes. As I understand, you've got the black country badge. Absolutely. On your, on Wherever your, I go. On your lapel. <laughs> um, but local politics was your way into this, being a councillor, working your way up. Um, it's funny, isn't it? We, under, we underplay the importance of local councillors and local politics. Uh, I think so. And I would be minded to think that actually if most MPs spent at least some time in local government before looking at national politics. They'd be cutting their teeth at the... At the coal face. That's what we would certainly say in the black country, at the coal yeah, face. Yeah. Because, um, because that's where they can probably most make that very real, tangible difference to, to people's lives. And it was probably one of the most satisfying times for me uh, when I entered politics at that, at that stage. And you had some family history in local politics. Oh, yes, yes. So my, my grandfather was a coal miner yep. uh, in the black country, and I followed very much his lead. And he was like a second father to me in so many, so many different ways. He, both his parents were dead by the age of 10 or 11, and he was down the coal mines at the age of 14, pretending to be 18. Yep. He went allowed, if not, and just as scratch a living. Hard and he, be he became the self-made man working really, really hard. And, and every moment uh, I could spend uh, with him, uh, I did. And I took a lot of my approach to life uh, from, from the values that he taught me. And Dudley and much of the black country, <clears throat> Walsall, all the rest of it, where yeah. you've been involved in politics and served as mayor there as well. Yeah. But Heartland Labour, you know, since 1918... Yeah. Since the boys came back from the front, it's been Heartland Labour and the coal mining communities. Yeah. Um, when did it start going wrong for Labour in areas like Dudley? I think for many, many years, for, for decades, people probably thought that their, when, it, when election time arrived, they did the thing that their fathers and their grandfathers always did, which was to vote a certain way. And, uh, and I think over time people realised that actually they were being taken for granted. Yeah. If, if, at the crux of it all, people voted can, you know, for Brexit and for the Conservative Party supporting Boris for many, many different reasons, whether it was illegal immigration, whether it was this, that or the other. And actually, you know, Jeremy Corbyn, lots of the Labour voters just couldn't support Jeremy Corbyn. Um, I actually think it's because Labour ignored them. Mm. I, that's how I would sum it up. Well, I saw it. I saw it, um, Marco. You know, they voted UKIP in big numbers. Yeah. They voted Brexit Party in big numbers. They voted... Yeah, Labour suddenly was a London party. It was disconnected. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. Brexit that's really brought these people into the Conservative yeah, I, fold, isn't it? Uh, yes. Yes, I think it, it, it is. And uh, because Boris, um, as, as a politician in particular also, I think, he's able to sprinkle that little bit of gold dust. He has that thing that a lot of politicians don't have, which is mm. something special. I can't quantify it into words. So there were a lot of things that came together for people uh, being able to vote uh, Conservative at the last election. But it, it was, it was some, it's something visceral, you know, for, for, for people. I was knocking on doors in 2019, and people would literally drag me into their home saying, mm. Marco, mm. I'm going to do something I've never, ever yeah, done before. Yeah, yeah. You need to just hold my hand and take me over the line. Will you do this, this, this and this? Mm. You know, illegal immigration was one of the things. And, 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 and so this is why I'm hell-bent on making sure that we keep to those promises, because otherwise there's a very serious danger that no, we'll, well, we'll be punished. We will come back to that. And I, it's interesting because, you know, you've had a successful career. Yeah. You've made some money. You've done well. Yeah. But I, I noticed one of the things on your CV was that you joined an oil and gas exploration <laughs> company. I mean, I'm, Absolutely. you can't be a great friend of Lord Goldsmith's or Carrie's oh, or anyone like that, I don't uh, suppose. Well. <laughs> I mean, you heard the debate, I think, that we were having earlier on tonight, yeah. you know, about Quadrilla. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is there a chance that the Prime Minister will change his mind on all of this? Because this increase in people's domestic bills actually is, is, is making us focus, isn't it, on the cost of some <clears> of those renewables? <throat> A absolutely. So, you know, we, we, we've had a war against COVID and we've, we're, we've now got a war on, on very high energy prices, which actually means a war on poverty in so many ways. Mm. 
Uh, so to me, uh, I mean, as a conservative, as a free marketeer and as a, as, as a pragmatic libertarian, a lot of the things we did during COVID is something that uh, I never thought I would ever do. And I think that in wartime scenarios, what we actually need to do is become more pragmatic about our way forward. And what I really dislike about the eco-warrior dogmatic agenda is that... Do you mean Boris's agenda? Uh, I, I mean the Zach Goldsmith's agenda. Well, it... well, I mean, Mr Johnson, your leader, said we should become the Saudi Arabia of wind. Um, I, look, you know, uh, I want my children and my grandchildren and their children to live in a decarbonised economy, and I think the move towards renewables is the right thing. But it's got to be done in a pragmatic, step-by-step -step way. That, that is what I would say. And I think most people would probably agree with that common sense approach. And it's about common sense. It's when you have that binary conversation that if you suddenly start saying that actually we need to be looking at our energy mix that for uh, risk reasons, for strategic reasons, must include some fossil fuel, i.e. gas and oil, that all of a sudden you're branded as a horrible person oh, yeah. who, who oh, yeah. is against climate, you know, climate oh, yeah. change yeah. denier and all of that yeah. kind of thing, is ridiculous. You know, and I can easily see how the Zach Goldsmiths would probably uh, label me that way. But I'm not. I just think we need the right energy misc, mix, the yep. right strategy. And if you look at what Oliver Dowden has said, and you might have seen Zach Small, Goldsmith and Oliver Dowden uh, being a little unhappy with each other. Yeah. And the last couple of Prime Minister's questions where the conversation and the tone towards fossil fuels mm. has changed. So I'm very happy with that. No, I mean, and, look, it's, it, I, I'm with you. It's a step in the right direction. Yeah. But as we know... Uh, you know, promises, uh, hints need to become reality. I, what was interesting, Marco, was, you know, and obviously this red wall phenomenon yeah. is something that I followed very, very intimately. And, and all those seats like yours, where I spent so much of my time campaigning over the years, because yeah. I realised that disconnect with old Labour that we've talked about. We came to Dudley. We did an event in Dudley a few weeks ago. Sadly, you had parliamentary business. We always invite the local MP. And they often come, but it needs to be the right day. <clears throat> What was interesting with that audience we met in Dudley, you know, really good people. Salt of the earth. Yeah, just great people. As always. And yep. people stayed afterwards for chats and pictures and conversations. Yep. But what did come out were some real concerns. Yep. Real concerns about the cost of living. People just not knowing quite what these bills are going to look like. <clears throat> and to business. Um, and, and, and also concerns that Dudley, it's lost so much. You know, I know the world moves on and I know the industries come and industries go and that's been going on since the sort of dawn of time almost yeah. that things change. But a feeling that Dudley's lost everything. It's lost the well-paid jobs. Mm. It's, it's, it's lost the things that it did so well. Yeah. And we keep talking, at least the government and the press keep talking, about levelling up. Yeah. I mean, Dudley is a prime candidate for someone that needs to be levelled up. That's right. How can it happen? Well, it can happen with with the right strategy and the right funding following it. And I think we are on that journey. Um, my concern is that when you have to turn such a big tanker around, it takes time. I would have said in ordinary peacetime, if we could put it that way, yep. you would probably need two parliaments. The fact that we've actually been paralysed by COVID for two years actually makes me very worried because... It will, I think it'll be difficult for people to see major changes mm. in the next two no, I, years, I, and that's when the election will take place. Well, I get the logic of that. And the other problem <clears throat> I think you've got, really interesting, and it wasn't just Dudley, you've seen it everywhere, but it was strong in Dudley, was a feeling that the GP, the family GP, yeah. the most respected member yeah. of the local community, somebody that everyone looked up to and respected, suddenly... Over half of the people in places like Dudley yeah. are losing respect for GPs, are losing trust and belief that the National Health Service yeah. is really capable yeah. of doing the right job. And it just gave me some echoes of that sort of 1995, 1996 period, not in Dudley, but in many other parts of the country, yeah. where the Conservatives lost swathes of seats to Tony Blair. By the way, I'm not suggesting Keir Starmer is Tony Blair. He's not. <laughs> um, but that worry that always through the years for the Conservative Party, health potentially was a bad issue for the Conservatives. Mm. What do you say to your constituents who say, I can't get a GP appointment? Uh, I quite agree. And, and it's a perfect storm. I've recently conducted a GP survey and the vast majority of responses, if not all responses, I'm still keeping it going, which is why I, 
I'm not going to give you uh, uh, detailed numbers now, but that issue of having being able to get a face-to-face -face yeah. appointment, yeah. And, and and most people, I it believe, matters to people, doesn't matters it? Matters to people, and and they want to see probably the same GP within the same practice, yeah. Yeah. because they develop that sort of relationship, yeah. and those relationships have been changing now for a very very long period of time. Mm. Mm. I mean, if I had things my way, dare I say it, I would be looking at GP contracts. I would be looking at. Many different things. Do you mean the? Do you mean Mr. Blair's reforms? Oh yes, yes. I'd be looking at the at the BMA, and I'd be looking at other things. And yeah, because you know GPs, you know there are some heroic GPs out there, and I, I don't want to besmirch everyone and and, and paint everyone with the same uh, no. brush, as it were. Um, but actually, uh, we have seen GPs now starting to behave and still talk about COVID and still doing telephone uh, conversations where so many things can be missed. So I'm completely with my mm. uh, residents over this and I will work as hard but as But they're going to blame can. you if it doesn't get better. I, they will blame and they can also, and the government. And, and, and they can also look, Marco. And I wouldn't blame them. You know, no, no, I mean, I, I, very honest with you. I, Keir Starmer, for all his faults, and he can't say what a woman is, for example, but for all his faults, he's pretty much expunged the hard left. He's done a good job on that. I think he deserves credit for it. That sort of very unpleasant, nasty Corbynista wing. They haven't got the influence that they used to have. Keir Starmer is now the party of cutting taxes. The Tories are the party of putting taxes up. <laughs> you believe that? <laughs> well, but it's true. I mean, you know, it's no good Rishi Sunak saying I'm a low tax guy and then putting taxes up for everybody, <clears throat> freezing the bans, dragging all sorts of people into higher rate tax. And that's what's coming, as you well know, over the next year or two. Uh, you've actually got Starmer. I've never heard Labour be pro-business, but they sort of do sound quite pro-business. Uh, they could even, uh, on health, they're not in a bad position either because they'll say, look, you know, it always goes wrong under the Tories. Um, uh, energy, I'm, they, they haven't faced up to energy at all. But there is, I, I, I put this to you, that a lot of people who voted Conservative in 2019 lent their vote to the Conservatives because actually finishing this agony of Brexit yeah. and, and the illegal immigration and all those things were subsets, really, of, as yeah. people saw it at the time. <clears throat> but there's a danger, isn't there, that the red wall doesn't hold? Uh, there is a danger, and I have been talking about this danger probably since the day I was elected and uh, over specific things in particular. And I am, I, am, I am pleased since the recent shake-up and changes at number 10 that I do sense there's a more receptive uh, uh, number 10. There are different people in place. And I really hope, for all of our sakes, that those changes now are going to start to be acted upon. We won't be able to use COVID as an excuse. It did paralyse us for two years. And I hope some voters mm. will recognise the huge efforts. Well and the personal effort in particular by the Prime Minister that he put in well, we'll find out. to save the country and we'll find businesses out. and individuals. Yeah. Now, there is an Italian side, of course, <coughs> in your family, as well as the black country side, and you're a Hence soccer fan, God. you're a Lazio fan. and of course, That's true. Did you go watch Paul Gascoigne when he played for I him? did. <laughs> I absolutely did, and those were very special moments. Yeah, he was, uh, was. It's a shame what's happened to him in some ways, but he was a bit of a star, wasn't he? He was. He had something special. Final thought. Do you enjoy being a Member of Parliament? It is the best job in the world for all of the difficulties that we face, for all of the fact that we can be vilified, as you know. Uh, for me, it, being able to represent a community and do my best for them and get the occasional thank yous that do come through makes it extra special. Almost believable. Marco Longhi, <laughs> thank you very much for joining me on Talking Pints. Very good.